Okay, so my class is on using magic, and I decided like six months ago that I was going to do this class, and so I thought, yeah, okay, I need to come up with some really cool stuff. And so I started looking into magic and magic tricks and things like that, and I found this great site, um, and so I decided to, to study some magic tricks online, and I wanted to do some for you guys. Um, it, was, it was a crazy site. I've been subscribed for like six months, and it's like $400 a month, but my uh, professor said, you know, I think you're finally ready to be able to perform these tricks in public. So I got the go-ahead, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it a shot here. So I hope everything goes as planned. <clears throat> Hang on. <sighs> okay. Like I said, I've never performed that in public before. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, <clears throat> on to the more serious side of magic. Okay. I wanted to start out with a magical quiz. So, number your papers, one to ten. <clears throat> and we are going to take a quiz. So, it's multiple choice A, B, and C. So, what you're going to do is right next to the number, you're going to write A. B or C, okay? but not all of them, or not even two, just one, okay? So pick your favorite answer, and then, and then you're going to write it down. Just write the letter down. So the first question, would you rather be able to A, jump up to 50 feet, B, run at any speed, or C, swim without breathing? Okay. You, everybody good? Okay, we're going on to number two. These are hard. Two, would you rather A, live 100 years in the future, B, live 500 years in the past, or C, live in the present? Three, would you rather be able to A, teleport yourself, B, teleport other people, or C, teleport objects? Numero cuatro. I watched Dora, okay. <laughs> Would you rather A, control other people's minds, B, read other people's minds, or C, move things with your mind? Isn't that called the force? <laughs> yeah, like all three of them? Yeah. <laughs> we'll be talking about the force later. Spoiler alert. Darth Vader is Luke's dad. I told you, spoiler alert. <laughs> okay. Number five. Would you rather go to A, Middle Earth, B, Hogwarts, or C, Narnia? It's tough, right? Ready for number six? Six. Would you rather A, have scales, B, have fur, or C, have feathers? Um, yes. you could choose. Let's go back, the back area. Okay, yeah, yeah. 
And your arms, too. Yeah, arms and back, okay? Number seven. Would you rather ride A, a centaur, B, a pegasus, or C, a unicorn? Can I choose an alicorn? Got to be one of these. Got to be one of these. <laughs> okay. Number eight. Would you rather be A, a dwarf, B, an elf, or C, a mermaid or merman? Okay. Number nine. Would you rather wield A, a sword, B, a laser gun, or C, a wand? I was going to throw a sonic screwdriver in there, but... But then I decided everyone would pick that, and so it wasn't a fair question. Okay. And the last one. Would you rather have A, super strength, B, super sight, or C, Super hearing. Okay. Let's see. Let's find out what your magical type is. Count up how many A's you have. And then count up your B's. And then count up your C's. How many were uh, predominantly A? Oh, sorry. We're still counting. Okay. I'll ask again in a second. Are we done counting? Okay, how many were predominantly A? Mostly A's. Okay, how many were mostly B's? Okay, how many were mostly C's? All right, who had a tie between A and B? Okay, who had a tie between B and C? And did anyone have a tie between A and C? Okay, cool. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at your magical types here. Um, so if there's a split, I couldn't really figure the splits out, but, I, but um, I have predominantly A, B, and C. So if you are an A type, you are a muscly, high-jumping dwarf living 100 years in the future. You teleport yourself to work but have to leave your sword and centaur behind. You vacation to Mordor where the orcs under your mind control moisturize your scales and serve you pina coladas. All right. <laughs> How many high jumping dwarfs do we have out there? Okay, nice. Okay, cool. Okay, moving on. Letter B. If you are mostly bees, you are a furry elf, impressing the people of 1514 with your deadly laser gun. Your keen eyesight and mind reading abilities have brought you many enemies. Luckily, you were able to outrun most of them. If any catch up, you quickly teleport them to Azkaban, where they are forced to watch your Pegasus do interpretive dance. <laughs> how, how many uh, furry elves do we have? Okay. Nice. Let's find out C here. If you're predominantly C, you are an eavesdropping mermaid. When on land, you prefer to travel by unicorn, which gives you time to preen your feathers. You've spent the last five years using your mind powers to float Turkish delight into your mouth. You take comfort in knowing that you can go back through the wardrobe and not a day will have passed at home. You used to be an expert at teleporting objects. That was before you teleported your wand. Okay, so um, anyway, kind of a little bit of fun there. Uh, you can see how you can start to brainstorm different magical ideas and magical concepts because what I did was I started thinking of different things that were magical. Um, and then I built them into quiz questions and thought as we answered them, it would kind of construct its own little story with mixed elements from different things. And so that's kind of how I came up with this. Okay, let's see here. So today we're going to talk about um, magic, in using magic in your writing and things like that. And one of the, the main points that we're going to kind of focus on is personal magic types. Okay, so this is magic that requires a person in order to be magical. And there are three, I kind of broke it down into three different types and we're gonna analyze those types. The first type is innate magic. Okay, innate magic, um, that means like internal and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Now the second kind is talisman magic and the third kind is skill-based magic. Okay, now my, my hope is that as we talk about all this stuff, you guys will start to have ideas of ways that you can like break conventions while you're writing your own story. So, um, so instead of just doing 
the same kind of magic that's been done year after year after year in books, you can start to kind of think of your own ideas and way to put your, your own spin on the magic. So let's take a look. So as you do this, I want everybody to think, who's, who's currently writing something right now? Yeah. Or has finished writing something? Yeah, is that Buck out there? No? no. <laughs> okay, so um, how many have magic in their writing? Pretty much everybody? Okay, cool. So I want you to think about the magic in your book as we do this and find out where your magic fits. Okay, is it an eight talisman skill? And we'll go on and talk about places and creatures and things like that too. First of all, innate magic, okay? This is internal magic. It's just part of you. Um, you're maybe born with it or, or it's just who you are. And a phrase that sometimes you might hear people say to someone if they had an innate magic would be, you are special, okay? But they probably wouldn't say it like that. All right, um, so a lot of the time this innate magic comes from thought. So you can just think something and then all of a sudden you're doing magic. Superman is a good example of this. Superman doesn't really seem to have any trouble when he flies. He's just like, and now I will fly. You know, and then he takes off. So like, it's obviously just innate. It's who he is and he doesn't have to think about, he doesn't have to perform any sort of trick or skill or anything. He just kind of leaps off the ground and goes flying through the air. So Superman is a good example um, of innate magic, which is internal, driven by thought. Another one is, um, I haven't seen this, kind of freaks me out, I'm not a big horror fan, but um, Carrie by Stephen King, basically is like some girl that can just make people die with her mind or something. Yeah, and so, and so, so she has innate magic because it's internal. She just thinks, I wish people were dying and then they just die or whatever. So that's really, that's the dark side of internal magic, okay? Um, then also a magical race. Okay, it's pretty common, it seems like, with innate magic, because I was thinking things through. Um, innate magic, like, it's common for a whole race to have this. Like, for example, in The Lord of the Rings, it seems as though the elves are a gifted magical race, where pretty much all of the elves have magic. Um, and, and whether that magic is internal or whatever, I'm not exactly sure, but, but basically you have a magic race. So think of your books, maybe you have a magic race, and does everyone in that race have internal, innate magic? Let's go to the next one here. Did you have a question? Anybody? Oh, yeah. Say it again. Like the X-Men, like yeah. Okay, yeah. X-Men are internal, innate magic, and it's kind of a race of them, of genetically modified people. Yeah, technically, and, and we kind of blur the lines of magic between science and, and magic because magic they're... Magic just science that we don't understand. Yeah, I like that. Magic, science that we don't understand. Okay, talisman magic. We got Frodo in the ring there. Um, is it secret? Is it secret? <laughs> so talisman magic is... External, which means that it's not part of your body. Pencils. And a common phrase you might hear with talisman magic is that it must not fall into the wrong hands. Because basically, anyone can use it if they get it. Like the One Ring, anybody. Like, take a look at Gollum, who was once Smeagol, who was just this normal dude fishing. I like fishing. And, you know, mid-fishing, he finds the ring, and he puts it on, and pretty soon it turns him into a creature over hundreds of years. And so it's kind of crazy because you have external magic that can be anything that anyone can, um, can use. So it must not fall into the wrong hands. Example, Lord of the Rings. So talisman magic often falls into trinkets, weapons, you can have a magical sword, um, and jewelry, like the ring. Another talisman magic... Cleaning supplies, yeah, good, okay, yeah, janitors, nice. So yeah, so um, in my, my book is definitely talisman magic based because the cleaning supplies are magical, but anyone that gets their hands on those, if they figure out how to use them, they, they can use them. And so mine, mine will kind of cross over talisman a little bit of skill because you have to learn how to use them too. But the one ring, it doesn't take any special skills to put that ring on your finger and then boom, you're magical, you know? And so that's why, say what? You have to be able to move, okay, yeah, yeah. So if you had no hands, yeah, then, then you're not gonna be very powerful with the, with the ring of power. Yeah. 
Yeah, maybe you could put it on your toe. That's a good idea. Toe, the toe ring of power. Okay. Skill magic. This is magic that is learned. Um, and anyone can do it. That may be a phrase you'll hear going with it. You just have to spend ridiculous amounts of time and risk life and limb to be able to learn how to do it. Um, a good example of this is the Bartimaeus trilogy. Anybody read that? Oh, I love those books. Okay, not, not too many. Let me tell you what it's about. It's about this kid. It's a, it's a, they're British novels, and um, it's this kid who's like 11 years old, and he lives in England where the parliament and everything is ruled by magicians. So it's kind of an alternate. It's, it's modern day, like today, but it's kind of an alternate reality where as though magicians ruled parliament. And the reason that the magicians have all of their power is not because they have innate magic. There's no magic within them. They don't have any special talismans. They have learned magic. And what they do is they draw pentacles on the floor, and then they summon genies and demons from another realm into the pentacle, and then they give them tasks, and then the demons go and do their jobs for them. It's very cool. So technically, their skill, their magic, is a learned magic. Because uh, in, the, in one of the very first scenes of the book, I think the very first chapter, Nathaniel, the main character, is summoning Bartimaeus, who is a, who is a genie. And he's an 11-year-old boy, and he's way out of his league trying to summon this powerful genie. And so he's, he's drawing the pentacle, and Bartimaeus appears in the room, and the first thing that Bartimaeus does is he looks for a weak link in Nathaniel's drawing. And he says, if there's anything weak in this drawing, I will immediately step out of my pentacle and crush you. And so all of his, so, so it's truly a, a skill magic, because you have to be skilled at drawing the right lines, you have to study and know what words to write in the pentacle and the little designs on the floor and everything. They have to like burn incense and candles. It sounds like super creepy and kind of demonic, but it's, it's really not. It's very well done and very fun. Okay, yeah, so the magician parliament, there are varying levels, but I believe, like, Nathaniel starts out as a, just a fledgling, uh, doesn't know anything, and by the third book, he's risen to a really high level. But it's not necessarily because he had anything special or innate within him, it's just because he got better and better at learning the skill magic. Um, it is a little bit confusing because technically, the genie are the ones that are executing the spells and the magic, um, so they have innate magic. The, jin, the genies in the book are the ones with the innate magic. It's just who they are. They're magical. But the magic is harnessed by humans through a learned skill drawing on the floor. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Yeah. So if you were to have a character that was like born magical, but they couldn't control it, and then they had to learn how to control it, but they always had the magic, would that be innate or skill? Or skill? We're getting there. Yeah. Okay, good. Oh, potions is another example of a skill magic. We'll address that in a second. So potions, you have to, a lot of the time in a lot of books, anyone can make a potion, but you have to know what ingredients to put in and exactly how to mix it. So it's a learned skill, but it's still magic. So, so we've now talked about the three basic types. What are they? Innate, um, talisman, and then skill. Now we're going to talk about mixes of those. So skill slash talisman magic. This is external magic because you have to have something that's not part of you, but it's also learned magic. So Harry Potter is a good example of this because Harry has to have a wand. He has to have the talisman, which is a wand, to do his magic. But if he just has a wand and he doesn't know any spells, he's pretty much useless. So he has to learn the skills that go along with his talisman. So he has that, he's external with his wand and then learned because he has to go to Hogwarts, he has to study, he has to learn the spells, he has to learn what figurations to wave his wands and things like that. So technically, anybody could become a wizard at Hogwarts, I believe. They could go and they could study. The term muggle is used for those that, you know, are not magical, but, but they could become isn't it Hermione that was from a muggle family, but she became uh, a witch? Yeah, so, so skill slash talisman magic. Um, does that make sense to everyone? Any questions on that one? Could it be all three? Could it be all three? We're going to get there, too. Because you need to have the blood of a wizard inside of you to do it. 
Do you? Yeah. So, so what was it? Because Hermione's parents were both muggles. So. But it can happen, which disproves the innate that, that the magic is within them. Technically, I guess there is a loophole there. So, um, but but maybe maybe it, you have to have the blood of a wizard or something in you. Yeah. Okay, now let's talk about skill and innate magic. This is magic that is internal, but you have to learn to control it. Is this yours that you were talking about here? Um, you are born with it, but it's out of control, okay? And uh, a phrase you might hear with this is, he is the most powerful of his kind, or she is the most powerful of her kind. Like Percy Jackson, who was born with the blood of Poseidon, and so he, he has the ability to control water, but he has to learn how to control it, which is the whole purpose of going to Camp Half-Blood. Because if he just knew how to control it, then he wouldn't have no, no trouble, and he wouldn't have to go to school or to Camp Half-Blood. Okay, um, often in, in skill and innate magic, there is a sense of discovery in these books because they've been going along, maybe living a normal life, and they realize that they're a little bit different, but they're discovering their powers. And then after they discover their internal powers, they have to learn how to control them. So I guess this is, that's the example that the question was over here about, about um, someone not being able to control it. I haven't seen Frozen, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't Elsa fit into this category. Okay. Okay. Let's go to the next one. Talisman and innate magic. This is where you have to have something internal within you. It has to be the right blood and the right internal, but it also has to be external. The phrase you'll hear with this is, only you can do it. So King Arthur is a good example because the sword was stuck in the stone and King Arthur was by blood the only one that could draw the sword from the stone. And so he had the internal magical components and then when he drew Excalibur, that was his talisman and Excalibur became his sword of power. So can you think of any other examples of talisman and innate? Yeah? Yeah? What did you say? Yeah. You can think of some? Okay, cool. So anybody have a book that might fit in this category here? Yeah. Sword of Shannara, good. Yeah, so that's, I love those books. Met Terry Brooks when I was a kid, um, and he was like one of my main motivations in, in me becoming an author was the, the, those books. And in those books, uh, the Almsford family are the only ones that can wield the sword. It's a magical sword. And it has to be them by blood, so it's innate, but the sword is their talisman, and they have to use it. But it doesn't really require a whole lot of skill. Um, a lot of the time, I mean, they just pick up the sword, and they just kind of hold it, and it does its magical thing. So that's why we haven't included skill into this section. Now we're getting there. Innate, talisman, and skill magic. This is a combination of everything. It's internal it's because it's internal, it has to be who you are. It's external because you have to have a talisman. And then it's learned because you have to know how to control it. So Jedi fall into this category because they have to have the right midichlorians in their blood. Whatever they are. So, so they, have to, they have to learn that. and then they, Or they have to have that internally. And then they have to get a lightsaber, which is their external talisman. And then they have to learn the force. So... What would be? The external talisman, there isn't really a talisman. The force is just the energy that right. flows through them. That they but can... show me a cool Jedi that doesn't have a lightsaber. <laughs> it doesn't happen. Not in the original, he doesn't. But he got to where he was because he used his lightsaber. Yeah. yeah. He chopped off so many hands. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Then Mistborn. Who's read Mistborn? Amazing series. Okay. Mistborn is about this, um, and, and the pitch of Mistborn, like talking about it, it sounds like so strange, and when you read it, it's the most amazing thing ever. Brandon Sanderson has a way of taking magic systems and just like turning them into the most unique, awesome things, and that's what I loved about Mistborn. And um, so, for example, in Mistborn, there's a group of people 
that have the ability, so they, they were born with this ability, so it's internal, but their ability is to eat, they eat metal, basically, like little shards of metal. And when they ingest the metal and it sits in their stomach, then they can burn the metal within their stomach and every metal that they eat gives them a different power. So they, so they can push metal objects away from them or pull metal objects toward them. They can, they can push people's emotions. They can pull on people's emotions. It's really, really cool, but it's really hard to master. And the first time, um, Vin, right? That's the main character. The first time when Vin is, is learning to steel push, she's up on top of a wall, and so she, she had it internally, the magic, then she took the external, the talisman, which was a piece of steel, tiny shred of steel, she ate it, and then she's standing up on top of this wall, and her mentor says, okay, now um, there's a piece of metal down there, and you're just going to jump off this giant wall, and you're going to push on the metal so that you slow your descent until you touch the ground. And she's totally freaked out, and she doesn't know what she's doing, and he basically kind of tosses her off. And, and she's like, you got to learn sometime, you know? And so it's, it's totally learned, because at first, she, she's not very good, but as she has a mentor and studies, she becomes learned in the magic. So that's internal talisman and skill. Um, I highly recommend Mistborn. It's very cool. Let's talk about magical locations for a bit. Okay, so when you're thinking about magical locations, you need to think about if it's natural. So a natural magic location is maybe something like a tree, a lake, or something like that that's naturally occurring. Say what? An elementary school. And that work, that's, falls into the constructed zone there. So, so with the natural, um, I'm going to go with who's read Artemis Fowl? Anybody read Artemis Fowl? Okay, cool. There's that seen in Artemis, the first book, where Holly is, she's supposed to fly to this sacred oak tree, or whatever, where she will then renew her magical powers by taking an acorn. I can't remember exactly. It's been a long time since I've read. But basically, that's a natural occurrence. This magical oak tree is, is the, the natural magical location. Then there's constructed magical locations. Hogwarts falls into this category because um, it was built by people, wizards, witches, and things like that. But it has magic of its own accord. And that's, um, and that's important. It's not just like, so my, the elementary school, for example, in janitors, the, the elementary school that they go to is technically not a magical, well, at, at times it's a magical location and at times it's not. Because in my book, in order to perform magical experiments, there has to be a warlock who takes, he has a nail and a hammer, and he has to pound the nail into a building. And as soon as he does that, then the building becomes a constructed magical location. And only in that building can he perform his experiments. If you pull the nail out of the wall, his, his domain, his magical construction, falls apart, and he's no, no longer able to perform his experiments and work with magic in that building. So my books, Janitors, the elementary school at times is a constructed magical location and, until the nail gets pulled out and then it's no longer magical, it's just a regular school. But Hogwarts is never going to return to be a regular school because staircases move and they're all wibbly wobbly. <laughs> okay, so is it stationary um, or is it mobile? Uh, so basically, when you, when you try to find, yeah, magical location, good, who said TARDIS? Okay, yeah, the TARDIS is a magical location and it's mo very mobile through time and space, right? And, uh, yeah? How about the magic school bus? Magic school bus, very great. It's a constructed, mobile magic location. Okay, um, yeah? Uh, what is the old Baba Yaga's moving house? Yeah. Yeah, good, Baba Yaga's moving house. It's an uh, old um, Scandinavian folklore and stuff. And okay, good. Uh, Jessica Day George Tuesdays at the Castle. The castle, the castle is a stationary. I suppose it's constructed because it's a building, a magical location. But it mostly stays in the same place, although it does grow on its own. Okay, the biggest question you have to ask yourself with the magic locations is what is its purpose in my story? Is it just there to be cool? Because if it is, it's questionable. You need to think about why it's there. So going back to um, 
Artemis fowl, the oak tree, it's, in, it's essential because it's at that oak tree where Artemis fowl first plans to kidnap his fairy. And so, and so he waits at the oak tree knowing that she will come to that stationary, natural, magic location. And when she comes, he's going to take her captive. So you have to ask, what's the purpose of, of your magic location? Let's talk about magical objects. Okay, is the magical object dependent upon other people? We're going back to Excalibur here, or the Sword of, of Shannara. So we have, is it dependent upon other people? A wand is a magical object, but a wand laying on the table does nothing by itself. So, that's, so those are some examples of dependent upon people. Or is the magical object independently operating? Does it just do its own thing, and it's just this magical thing that kind of roams around and kind of has maybe a life of its own, but is technically an object, not a creature, because we're going to get to creatures later. The ring? Yeah, the one ring. Okay, good. Yeah, the, the one ring operates independently. It just, it's stationary. That's really cool. So it's stationary because it just sits there, but it calls people, and it kind of lures them over to it, and then once they see it, they feel this burning desire to put it on. So it's operating all by itself. It's trying to get it to, to be used. Okay, are the, natu- are the magic objects natural? Um, going back to Artemis Fowl and the little acorn that Holly takes from the oak tree. Um, it's a natural occurrence. It's a natural magical object. Or are the magical objects constructed like a wand, which they have to build in a wand shop in Harry Potter? So think about your magical objects in your book and where they fit in, these story, in, in your story. Okay, let's see. Oh, wait, I went backwards. Magical creatures, are they mythical? And if they are mythical, so name some mythical creatures. Oh, Elves, yeah. centaurs. Oh. Okay, griffins, yeah. Dwarves. Dwarves, they're all, those are all mythical, magical creatures. Mermaids. Mermaids, yeah. Okay, so here's the question, though. When you're writing about them, are you writing them in a conventional sense? or in a non-conventional sense, meaning that are your vampires rising up out of their coffins in the night with their pointy teeth and a black cape, and they're wandering around, and they're finding people, and they're biting their necks and drinking their blood, and then going back to sleep, or are your vampires running at hyper speeds and sparkling in the sun? You know, so, so let's take, but it's important to think about, you know, I'm seeing a lot of, like, reboots of movies and stuff, and what they're doing is a lot of the time, and and reboots or or just they're coming up with ideas, and they're taking conventional mythical creatures, and they're putting a non-conventional spin on those mythical creatures. Sometimes it's for better, sometimes it's for worse. Um, Artemis Fowl, awesome example. It's he, Artemis Fowl, Owen Colfer, has very non-conventional dwarves. Um, for those of you that haven't read it, the dwarves are small, their beards are very wiry, and their, their hair, they can pluck their hair, and they can insert it into a lock, and then it hardens, and they can use it to pick the lock. They, their jaws unhinge, get this, this is awesome, their, their jaws can unhinge, and they can eat through the ground like an earthworm, and they just kind of tunnel underground, but they have to remember to always open their bum flap on their little jack suits that they wear. And then, and then after, after ingesting all of this earth, of course, they have to discharge it at some point, and it's highly volatile. And, and Anyway, it's super clever. It's like, it sounds so crazy when you explain it to people, but execution of these stories is, is where it's all at. So th- that's a very non-conventional idea of a dwarf. But then you have Terry Brooks, um, like in The Sword of Shannara, or, um, or The Lord of the Rings, Actually, Terry calls it Shannara. <laughs> so, um, and, then, and then the dwarves in The Lord of the Rings are much more conventional, what we think a dwarf would be. Mining, small. I think Peter Jackson did a great job in The Lord of the Rings. Okay, let's talk about magical origins. Where is your magic coming from? 
coming from gods that are giving people magic? Is it coming from science? Um, is it coming from aliens that are imbuing some sort of power upon people? Or was it always there, but it was just dormant? And then at some point, it awakened. So it's important to think about the magical origins and to question them. And the way you do this is just by going backwards farther and farther. So, for example, when I'm doing janitors, I think, okay, I started out with the idea of a magical cleaning supply. A magic, uh, we'll go with a mop. So I've got a magical mop. Well, how did it become magical? Okay, well, someone made it magical. But what did he use to make it magical? Okay, well, he had a substance that was called glop, which is this muddy, bubbly, smelly, nasty, gooey stuff. Um, but then he had to make his own potion out of the glop. And then once that specific potion was made, tailor-made to, to cause a mop to become magical, then the mop had to be touched to the potion, and then the mop became magical. Okay, so I'm going back. But now, all of a sudden, I run into another question. Where did the glop come from? So then I trace it back. And I'm not going to tell you guys because that's a big part of the later end of the series. Um, but, the, but you trace it back and they, they, you know, there's got to be a source where all the glop comes from. Okay, well now we found the source. But who made the source? Or where did the source come from? Or what is the source like? Oh, then we can trace it back even farther. Let's take the Arthurian legend. We have Excalibur in the stone. So who put it in the stone? Well, I don't know. Who? Mer Merlin, right? Or maybe it was the Lady of the Lake. There's two different stories, right? So if it was Merlin, where did he get his power? And you trace it back farther. If it was the Lady of the Lake, who's the Lady of the Lake? Why is she magical? Where'd she come from? Why is the lake magical? And you just have to trace it as far back as you possibly think you can. And when you get all the way back to the very origins, you should always be able to take your magic system farther back than anyone will ever know. So that it might not all come out in your writing, but... If anyone were to ask you, you have a ready answer. Um, so it's a little bit confusing with the origins. Okay, terminology, we've got made-up words like muggle. Half-blood is not really made up, but um, glopify is what I was explaining in my book. When they use the magical glop to cause items to become magical, they call it glopifying. And then in um, Mistborn, when they eat the metal, it's called allomancy. And so they're allomantics. And so those are made-up words. So you want to think, do I have a made-up word? And then how do I use that made-up word? And maybe I, maybe I use it wrong sometimes or not consistently. And that, oh, oh man, we got a lot to get through real quick. Okay, so consequences to the magic. There are internal consequences and external consequences. With the internal consequences, when you use magic... What kind of feelings does it cause? Uh, the force is a good one here because if the force is magic, when they use the force, it causes them to have internal feelings as a consequence. And sometimes they feel rage and sometimes they feel so angry. And then the, if they give in to that, they turn to the dark side and that is a huge consequence of using the force. That every time they use the force, they expose themselves to those feelings and they have to learn to control them. Also feelings of isolation and, and maybe... Um, you know, the more you use that magic, the less people around you like you, the less they can relate to you, um, and you isolate yourself, which is an internal isolation where you're feeling lonely. Yeah? Um, in Steelheart, it's hard for them to control not being, not being with the power. Okay. Cool. So in Steelheart by Brandon Sanderson, it's, it's difficult. Their consequence is internal, right? Because it's hard for them to not give in to the power that they're using. Then external consequences. Um, sometimes it can cause damage to yourself or other people. Uh, if you use magic, does it leave you physically drained and exhausted? Or would it be worse if what if it left the nearest person to you physically drained and exhausted? So then all of a sudden, so this is what I'm talking about. You take an idea that seems conventional and then try to find a way to make it your own. Um, also, another external consequence could be maybe the more you use magic, the weaker your magic becomes. Um, in Robert Jordan's series, uh, The Wheel of Time, uh, it's described as like a thread of finite length. So if the magic is a thread this long, then you start, to, you start to do these events using magic, but the thread moves forward. And when you get to a point, if you use more magic, it will start to undo the things that had been done by the thread of magic in the past as the, as the magic moves forward. Does that make sense? 
yeah, really cool ideas. Um, and that's, so that's kind of a weakening, that's a consequence is that the magic becomes weaker. Spells can undo themselves as you use more magic. There was a hand up. Hand, no? Did you have a question? No. Oh, say it. Ah, yeah. Interesting. So, Nico, because he's son of Hades, has different consequences than Percy and Annabeth because of their heritage. Limitations. This is huge in magic systems. Superman, and you might all hate me for saying this, but I don't, Superman's one of my least favorite superheroes because he doesn't have enough limitations. He's so powerful, and the only thing that really is his weakness is kryptonite, which you can't even get on Earth. So, you can limit their strength, the strength of the magic. You can limit the number of times it can be used. You can limit the application. In janitors, the application of magic is limited. You can only, the rule is you can only use magic on things that w are useful in the line of janitorial work. So basically cleaning supplies. I'm limited there. You can't just glopify a sports car and drive a million miles an hour. Um, so I've, I've limited who or what is affected. Yeah? Hmm. stronger, he has to like fly up really high, or if he's down low too long, then he starts to wear off. Okay. Like cool. So they've, they've kind of, they've tried to change it because they realized he didn't have enough weakness. He needed more limitations, Superman. So duration, um, like the thread of magic, um, maybe magic just doesn't last very long. That can be a limitation. Limitations through type. If it's innate, then only the people that are born with it can use it. If it's a talisman, only the people that have the talisman. And if it's a skill, only the people that learn it. Malfunctioning limitations. Maybe sometimes, every now and again, the magic just doesn't work. And there's no, maybe no real reason for it. So in Janitors 2, um, there's this moment where they get these janitorial belts that are loaded with cleaning supplies. And it's, it's kind of in beta, so it's not like a perfect belt. The, the warlock has it. He's like, there's still some problems with it. I don't know if we should take him into battle. Spencer wears one into battle, and um, at one point he reaches in to his, to his pouch to grab some vacuum dust, which he's going to throw. And when he reaches into his, his belt, it, his hand gets stuck, and it backfires. And his belt just randomly malfunctions at this pivotal moment. And as he's trying to get his hand out, it, it's stuck in his belt. And it kind of creates some tension there. So malfunctioning can be limits. Okay, this is the hugest point that I want to drive home in the last two minutes. Well, yeah. Um, consistency. You have to question everything, like we were talking about with the origins. You have to know you are the expert on your story. Okay, that means that no one else knows your magic system better than you, which means you have to be the expert. Okay. Characters and the plot must operate within your magical structure. It can't be the other way around. You have to have a really solid foundation of magical structure, and your characters and plot have to operate within that. Can I tell you, um, without spoiling anything, who's seen Gravity, the movie? Anybody? Okay. Okay. Drove me crazy. I couldn't, hand I couldn't handle it, because at one point, they needed the physics of space to change for the plot. And so what did they do? They changed space physics for, for just one moment in the plot so that something important could happen. And it drove me crazy. I was like, you can't do that. You can't change physics to fit your plot. So never sacrifice consistency, not even for plot. Okay? Find another way around it. Don't break your magic system. If you've set up the whole time that it's going to be one way and then all of a sudden you realize, oh, in order for the plot to happen, I have to contradict myself. Find another way to make the plot work or change the entire thing. So that's the point, biggest point that I want to drive home is as you guys are writing, this will make your writing stand out from so many other writers and, and aspiring people that are, that are writing stuff is to make your magic consistent and unique. Last, Shel Silverstein. Sandra's seen a leprechaun. Eddie touched a troll. Laurie danced with witches once. Charlie found some goblins gold. Donald heard a mermaid sing. Susie spied an elf. But all the magic I have known, I've had to make myself. 
He's awesome, Shel Silverstein. So thank you guys. Um, as, you're, as you're writing, I hope that you can have magic in your own writing. And um, thank you for coming today. I think we're finished up.